And we're on. Okay, let's go ahead and just finish up with the um, surfactants and mucolytics. I just want to go ahead and uh, can everybody see my poorly drawn picture here? So what this is, is if you can imagine, this is a glass of water in here. And I have a tack, a little thumb tack. And it's floating on the surface of the water. Do you think that's possible for this to float on the surface of the water? Well, sure, right? Uh, we have something called Archimedes' principle, and I have a force. Um, there's a force applied by the water, and, and of course, there's a certain amount of buoyancy that this has. But the water itself at the surface here, is the water kind of attracted? Are the molecules attracted to each other? And how are they attracted to each other? Hydrogen bonding, Hydrogen bonding right? Um, let's just draw a water molecule here. So I have H2O, right? Mm -hmm. I have oxygen, and then I have the single covalent bonds and two hydrogens. Now, what property does oxygen have? That's a periodic property. It starts with an N, or E, I'm sorry, it starts with an E. It's, it has something to do with oxygen really liking electrons. There you go. It's electro electronegativity. Electronegativity. It's highly electronegative, right? Mm -hmm. Highly electronegative. Uh, fluorine, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine are your highly electronegative elements. And it pulls on the electron, right? Mm -hmm. And it pulls on the electron that hydrogen has. Would you guys would you guys agree? So if it pulls or tugs on that electron, that electron spends more time around oxygen. What we say is its probability density is more around oxygen. Would you guys agree? Mm -hmm. So is that going to change the way the charge is distributed in this molecule? What do you guys think? Is it going to be evenly distributed? If I have more electron, electron spending more time here than here, will I have uniform charge? No, right? Because I'm going to have, the electrons are over here around the oxygen more. What is that going to make this part of the molecule? Polar. Polar. It's going to make it more negative, right? Because they're, the electrons are spending more time here, if you want to look at it that way. Because the oxygen is electronegative. It's pulling on them. So this is going to be partially negative. And we won't say it's totally negative, like an ionic bond, but it's partial negative. It's pulling on the electrons, but hasn't totally taken them away. Does that make sense? So this part of the molecule is going to be partially negative. What's this part of the molecule here going to be? Partially positive. And I have a separation of charge. So a negative part here and a positive part here. So then when I get another water molecule, here, we'll just draw another, mar oh, another water molecule, and I have a partial negative, the partial positive, partial positive, is there going to be an attraction between these two molecules here? Yes, the positive of the hydrogen here is going to be attracted to that oxygen, right? And likewise, the oxygen is going to be attracted to the hydrogen. And that type of attraction is what holds water together and keeps it a liquid, and that's obviously called a hydrogen bond, hydrogen bonding. Um, very important with water. One of the most important intermolecular forces that we run into. So is that hydrogen bonding occurring at the surface of the water? Would you guys agree that it is? Yes. And that is a part of what creates the tension at the surface is that there is this intermolecular attraction. The water molecules are attracted to each other, and that creates a surface tension. So you guys would agree that I could float a tack on the water here. So what happens if I put some surfactant in here? We'll draw that as blue. <laughs> and look at the surfactant is basically kind of um, taking up space. And maybe um, it kind of blocks. It kind of comes in between the water molecules a little bit. What's that going to do to the tension here at the surface, the attraction? Decrease. It's going to decrease it. So there's decreased force on this little thumbtack here. So what do you think is going to happen? It's going to sink. 
Absolutely. And you can do this, a simple experiment at home, take a cup of water, float a little tack on there, or even a um, paper clip will float on there, and put a little bit of soap. A little, um, just any kind of soap. Um, dish soap. Because what is dish soap? It's a detergent, right? It's an amphipathic molecule, and it's a detergent. It will act the same way as surfactant, because surfactant is very similar in, in a lot of um, aspects to detergents. Detergents decrease surface tension. And um, you'll see that, that uh, little thumbtack uh, kind of sink. And with that, I want to go ahead and just show you guys a couple of quick videos, and then we can go ahead and do a little review. So we'll start this guy back up here. Projectors warming up. It'd be nice if we get a nice L, uh, LCD display, big big display projector, and it could just be instant. I guess that's just my American instant gratification there. Okay, so can you guys all see this picture here? So here I have a glass. I have water in it, and then what we're going to do is we're going to add some surfactant um, or some detergent into this water. And you guys all agree that the, the little thumbtack here is floating. All right. So we're adding some detergent now, and adding a little more, boom, there it goes. Crazy, huh? Physics works. Physics works. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, surfactant administration on a little kiddo here. And you can see this little kiddo right behind, um, I believe this is a physician that's giving it, but right behind her. Is a, is a weird looking machine and that's actually called an oscillator. You guys won't actually talk about these until toward the end of the program when we do neonatal and pediatrics. But it's a very special kind of ventilator that we use on, on little ones called oscillator. You guys see this little machine here? This is another real special machine. And what this is, is this is delivering a medication that we're going to talk about here in a few lectures uh, when we talk about inhaled gases. And this medication is called nitric oxide. And um, without going into too much detail, what it does is it is used to treat pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so we've got the oscillator here, um, nitric oxide here, and then you won't see it now, but to the right of that, you'll see a monitor, the baby will be on. So just to let you guys know what, what all that equipment is. Okay, so I'm going to just turn the sound down here. Okay, and you guys can hear it okay up there. So he's just hooking up to the tube here. So this is a little port that hooks up into the endotracheal tube right here. And you can see the syringe with the surfactant in it there. He's just threading that down into the endotracheal tube. You see that? Zoom in a little bit. Just going down into the endotracheal tube. And then uh, they're actually injecting it. And you can kind of kind of see it going down, maybe. Okay. So it's going in. Obviously, there's an alarm that's going off because they they have a tube in there. I think that the doctor is going to complain here in a little bit. Turn it off. I hear that. You're going to get that from physicians <laughs> every so often. So you're just administering it nice and slow. And you can see how he's kind of turned a little bit on one side here. And kind of how the head is, is turned a little bit. And the body is, is turned just a little bit um, on this blanket here. Uh, we'll just fast forward it a little bit. So here's the pulse oximeter, here's a nitric oxide machine, and there's that uh, oscillator, ventilator I was telling you guys about right here. Okay, so now we're going down again, and you can see, can you see how he's turned over on the other side there? Going down again, we'll administer it, and we'll get um, the other lung. 
And so this is the other half of the dose that, that they're administering. And that is how we give uh, surfactant. Um, what is the name of the condition that babies develop when they don't produce enough surfactant? What is the name of that condition? It starts with an I. IRDS. IRDS. And it stands for Infant Respiratory Distress Syndrome. There you go, IRDS. Have you heard of something called ARDS in adult patients? Or Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. You guys heard of that yet? You will, if you haven't. You will. It's a, it's a big deal uh, in adult patients. Uh, it's very similar to what happens in, in, in babies. Um, a, uh, of course, in adults, it's due to very different mechanisms. Um, so the question is, do you think we could give surfactant to adults that have ARDS? If ARDS is very similar to IRDS? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it particularly effective? Not like in babies, actually. Um, why that is, we're not sure. ARDS is a bit more complicated. Uh, or not necessarily more complicated, but there are different things at play. ARDS is usually a traumatic insult to the lungs. Some sort of um, insult. If you were hypovolemic and you didn't get good perfusion or you have a really bad infection. Um, IRDS is simply the lungs aren't mature enough. Uh, so it may be just a difference in the, the pathology that's going on between those two conditions. Okay, uh, I think that's about it. Um, let's go ahead and do a quick review. How's that, how's that sound? You guys want to do a quick review? Okay, so uh, midterm exam is going to be just like exam one. It's not going to be long, only about 20 questions. Okay. <laughs> but on the other hand, they're not going to be very specific. I'm not asking very highly specific questions. You know, I'm asking more broad, can you appreciate the bigger picture? So I am not going to ask you uh, really detailed specific questions. I'm not going to ha uh, have a structure of uh, a salogenin and a structure of a catecholamine and, and tell you guys, all right, what is the difference in the side chain between these two? Okay? Oh, I'm not going to ask you that. Okay, nothing detailed like that. It's going to be a bit more broad. Um, so let's go ahead and just start. Uh, the first lecture was the introductory stuff, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. Um, are you guys good on kinetics and dynamics? You know that there are different types of uh, phases of kinetics. You have your absorption. You have distribution. Metabolism and el elimination excretion. Okay, good. Pharmacodynamics, what goes on with pharmacodynamics? What the drug does to the body, right? So that's where we get our mechanism of action. That's where we get, you know, what side effects do we have, things like that. Okay, good. Are you guys good with some of the regulatory stuff? Like what agency regulates medications? Yeah. The FDA. Yeah. Are you guys good with where we would get information? about medications. Okay, what is the um, officially recognized a source that is non-biased in the United States? Not the PDR. It's the USP, the United States Pharmacopeia, that's considered the, tr the non-biased, true non-biased source. US what? USP, United States Pharmacopeia. That was in that, yeah, that lecture one there. Okay. okay. All right, good. Um, I'm not going to ask a whole lot about the chemical reactions, like ox oxidation, reduction, um, dehydration, hydrolysis, things like that. Uh, I'm going to stay away from that. Uh, big concepts. Math. Are you guys a, a bit more comfortable with medical math? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let, let's just go ahead, and we have time. Let's just go ahead and work through a problem real quick, okay? okay. So let's say that I want to give 600 milligrams of mucamist or uh, in acetylcysteine and I have 20% solution on hand. So what is this question asking? The, the physician's ordered 600 milligrams. I have a vial of 20%. I can even draw that here. A little vial, 
20%. So it's asking how many milliliters do I need to pull out of this vial to give to the patient, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and break it down step by step. I know some of you probably already have it in your head, boom, not a big deal. Uh, but uh, for those of you that I kind of do like doing it step by step myself, but so 20% equals what? 20, 20 what in 100? 20 grams. 20 grams in 100 milliliters. That equals how many, because we're talking milligrams here, right? So that equals how many milligrams? 20,000 milligrams in how many milliliters? 100. Can I simplify this? Yes. yes, I can knock out zeros here. And that gives me 200 milligrams per milliliter. Everybody's good there? And I need to give 600 milligrams. So 1 milliliter equals 200. 2 milliliters equals 400, right? 3 milliliters equals 600. So how many milliliters do I need to give? Three, three. three milliliters. Excellent. All right. That's all there is to it. It's, it's just about as easy as that. Now, might you have to do it with 0.5%? Sure, sure, you may have to do 0.5%. Is it the same thing? Yes, 0.5% is 0.5 grams. Oh, we can just do it real quick. So 0 0.5 grams in 100 milliliters. That's how many milligrams? 500 milligrams in 100 milliliters. That's, can we simplify that? Mm -hmm. Yes, knock out zeros. That's 5 milligrams per milliliter. If the physician ordered 2.5 milligrams, say this is 0.5% albuterol, mm -hmm. How many milliliters would we pull out of that vial? One half, or 0 0.5 milliliters, right? Because if one milliliter equals five milligrams, 0 0.5 or half of that will equal how many milligrams? 2.5, there you go, okay, 2.5 milligrams. You don't even need to do a dimensional analysis on, on most of the, the, the problems that you run into here. You can, you most certainly can, but you don't necessarily need to. All right. So let's move on to uh, aerosols or um, aerosolized medications. You guys good with the optimal breathing pattern for de delivering? Mm -hmm. Yes. What's the optimal breathing pattern for delivering an aerosol treatment? Slow, deep, deep, deep inspiration deep. with Body an inspiratory back. hold. There you go, yeah. There you go. Is that really going to happen in real life? No. Probably not, <clears throat> because you know your patient's going to be breathing fast and having a hard time, but that is the optimal pattern. Okay, let's talk about uh, DPIs, dry powder inhalers. What kinds of patients get DPIs? Okay, so I need to have a good inspiratory flow. Yes. And what is the general recommendation? How many liters a minute? Yeah, 60 liters a minute. 50, 60 liters per minute of inspiratory flow. So I need to have a really good inspiratory flow. So if somebody is in distress, let's say they need rescue, would I necessarily want to give them a DPI? No, no, that would probably not be the, 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 the first choice of medication. Okay, um, then that brings us, uh, let's see, into um, a little bit about bronchodilators. Bronchodilators, I want you guys to identify the general time. So we have our short, we have our short acting bronchodilators. And what are some examples of short-acting bronchodilators? Epinephrine. There we go. Epinephrine. What else? What about isoephrine? Mm -hmm. Even though we don't necessarily give them a lot. How about isoproteinol? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So this is the big one that we might end up giving. What is the general duration? of the short-acting? 
one to three hours. Would you guys agree? One to three hours. Okay. What are these good for? Rescue. There we go. Rescue. Yeah. Emergency. You're right. You're emergency. But you'll often hear the term rescue if I need to rescue my patient from uh, acute bronchospasms. Okay. Um, can we use epinephrine for something else? Specifically racemic epinephrine. What can we use racemic epinephrine for? Post um, not so much anaphylaxis, but um, for upper or lower airway issues. Upper. Upper airway issues. Yeah, for Strider. Yeah, yeah. So I will put racemic epi here, and that's going to be Strider, like post extubation. How about kids? Is there a um, a disorder that we might use it for with kids, pediatric patients. Croup. There you go. Croup. Subglottic edema. Okay, good. And what does racemic mean? What is the meaning of racemic? What does that mean? Yeah, it's isomer or enantiomers, right? And it's a one to one mix of the right and left hand form of a molecule. Okay, everybody's everybody's okay with that? Is a one to one mixture of the right and left hand form of the molecule. What does that mean? What does right and left handed mean? It means you have exactly the same number of carbons and hydrogens and oxygens and what have you in that molecule. But the only difference is they're placed just a little differently, right? They're placed a little differently. And it's basically a mirror image. So what, using a hands analogy, does that work for the most part? So here I have a molecule, it's left-hand version, and here I have the right-hand version. Can I put them on top of each other and they'll look the same? No, they're non, what we call superimposable. Um, but if I were to hold my right hand up to the mirror, the image that I saw reflected back, would that be kind of the same thing as an enantiomer or an isomer of my hand? Mm -hmm. Sure, it's a mirror image. It's a mirror image. Okay. Can the enantiomers have, do the different types have different effects? Yes. Yes, they can. Okay, so those are my short acting guys. What about kind of my intermediate? What about my intermediate? What are some examples of intermediate? Albuterol. Okay, albuterol. What else? Zopinex. Zopinex. What else? Proventol, Proventol is albuterol. Oh, yeah. Leave albuterol, Zopinex. What about, um, it starts with a B or a T. Terbutylene, right? Terbutylene, yeah. These are salogenes here, right? Albuterol, Zopinex. Terbutylene is what? Is terbutylene a, a salogene? No. It is in a different class of medications. You guys remember from last week, there were a couple of different classes of intermediates. These are considered the salogene, and terbutylene is in a little different class. I'm not going to ask you guys to differentiate the classes, though, so much as just to know that these are intermediate acting ones. What is the duration of action on these intermediates? Four to six. About four to six. And what do we use these for? <coughs> Maintenance? Yes Rescue and no. Maintenance. What else? Rescue? What do you guys say? Rescue? Yes. Yes, we can use these for rescue as well. Because what, uh, how are these different <coughs> than the um, catecholamines in the short? How are these different? Fewer, fewer side effects. Fewer side effects. So these have, are more beta 2 specific, right? Mm -hmm. If I give somebody epinephrine, what receptors am I going to hit? One. I'm going to hit my alpha 1. I'm going to hit my beta 1. I'm going to hit my beta 2. Hit it. Yeah, I'm going to hit everything when I give something like epinephrine. So I'm going to have lots of side effects. Do I necessarily like all those side effects? No. 
So I can give these intermediates that have more beta-2 specific activity. And so I can use them for rescue and, and some maintenance as well. And then what about my long-acting? What is an example of a long-acting? Cerebin. Cerebin. There you go. Brain. Yeah. And um, what is their duration of action? Approximately how many hours? 12. 12 hours. Right, about 12 hours. And what do we use these for exclusively? Maintenance. Would we ever use a long-acting for rescue? No. All right. Good. If you guys have got that, you're doing really good on bronchodilators. If you got that. What is the standard dose for epinephrine? Um, not epinephrine, albuterol. I'm sorry. What is the standard dose for albuterol? 2.5 to 5 milligrams, right? How about Zopinex? And we're, these are all adult doses, too. These are standard adult doses. Zopinex. What about Zopinex? 0.63 to 1.25 milligrams. Everybody's okay there? All right. Um, what about anticholinergics? Do I have anticholinergic bronchodilators? What is the big one that we talked about? Starts with an A. It's, it's, it's a derivative of atropine. Atrovent. <laughs> what is the generic name for atrovent? Starts with an I. I Ipotropium. You guys have that on your drug cards, right? <laughs> okay. Better study those guys. They're all mixing them together. Okay. Yeah. Ipotropium hydrobromide. Okay. Do we give atropine, um, uh, atrovent, excuse me, by itself as a rescue drug? <coughs> is it a good rescue drug by itself? No, we would always want to give something like albuterol. And, and when I have a combination of albuterol and atrovent, then we can get drugs like duonebs. Duoneb is a combination of an anticholinergic and a bronchodilator. And what is the other class that we don't see used quite as much? It's related to caffeine. Starts with an X. Xanthine derivatives, X A, xanthines. And what is the major xanthine that we run into? Starts with an A. Am. Atropine is an anticholinergic. Aminophilin or theophilin, right? Theophilin, right? Are there some major toxicities associated with theophylline? Yes. Yes, yes, there's some high risk of toxicity, lots of side effects. And what else do we have to do on patients that are taking theophylline? Do we have to monitor their blood levels, the, what we call the peak and the trough levels of theophylline? We don't want their blood levels to get too high, or they can have lots of different problems with xanthines. All right. So those are all your bronchodilators. The big doses that I, I want you guys to focus in on are these two right here, the albuterol and Zopinex, because you guys will be using a lot of this. So you have 2.5 to 5 milligrams of albuterol mm -hmm. and then 0 0.6 to 1.25. To 1 mm -hmm. So you may be given a scenario. You, I could give you a scenario. A patient comes in, they're having wheezing. The physician's worried about bronchospasm and wants to order albuterol, but isn't quite sure of the dose, and then you'll have a list of different doses, and you'll have to choose, you know, what is, you might run into something like that. Well, it's like 2.5 or 5, right? No. Okay. <laughs> you guys remember my last test, right? Was there a whole lot of craziness on that test? No. No. No, it's straightforward, to the point, and I don't get, I get very specific in my lectures. Uh, but I don't necessarily, I'm not that specific on my exams. Would I like you guys to know how we mix and match the, the different oxygens and hydrogens on the benzene ring and the side chains? I'd love it. I'd love to talk about that all day long. But we got we to gotta live in a real world, too. So I'll talk about it. I don't necessarily expect you guys to memorize it because 
probably about only about 10% of what I say actually sticks anyway. So. That's why you guys go home and study, though, right? That's why you go home, you study, you read the book, you look over your notes. I put every single lecture that I do on YouTube for you guys, um, and that's where the real learning happens is actually what you do at home. Okay, guys, guess what? That is it. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, and um, what we covered today, there will be some questions about mucolytics. Uh, some of the big questions would be, like, safety-related. If a physician has ordered... Um, Mucomist. Give mucomist 600 milligrams TID. What do you think of that order? Call what do you guys think? First. There you go. Call the physician back and say, hey, doc, would you like albuterol or Zopinex with that? <laughs> yes? Um, how about the nervous system? Um, the nervous system, know the receptors primarily with the nervous system. Um, know what, what would happen if I have an alpha a beta-1, a beta-2 response, what an anticholinergic response would look like. Which so would be, yeah, like anticholinergic would be like atropine-like, dry out secretions, increased heart rate. Okay. Um, what a cholinergic response would look like, okay. yeah. Okay. You know, lots of uh, secretions, bronchospasm, things like that. Uh, so those kinds of questions. Okay. Uh, again, I'm not going to go real in-depth into the chemistry, even though I talked about the chemistry of the molecules. I'm not going to go in a lot of depth, simply because there are the real critical things that I want you guys to know, important things, and that's what I'm going to focus in on. Okay, so uh, again, what we'll do is we'll come in uh, Monday, and um, what I'm going to plan to do is I'm going to plan to come in at 7.30, and that way, if you guys have questions or whatever, uh, you can come in a little early and, you know, we can work through problems or whatever. Uh, we'll start the test at 8. And uh, you'll have about uh, 20, 25 minutes to finish that test. I'll go ahead and run the Scantron through. And we'll get the grades. And then we, the second half of the class, we will have a lecture. Uh, I believe it is going to be on asthma and anti-inflammatory agents. I believe is the next one. So it would be a pretty quick lecture. And um, also, since I have you guys here for a few more minutes, let's go ahead and talk about the presentations. Uh, they'll be coming up in uh, toward the end of November, I believe, beginning of December. Yeah. So let's just go ahead and talk about those real quick. Again, I do not want you guys to write a paper. I don't want a paper. Okay, so no paper, no APA format paper. Uh, I want a short PowerPoint. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and write the topics up. And you guys are going to need to split yourself into groups and choose a topic and then send me an email through Blackboard and... Just one person can send me an email and say, okay, we're, we're the group and, you know, I we're, we're ha uh, have person A, person B, person C, and we're doing this topic. Um, send me that email. That way I know what group is doing what. And the topics uh, are going to include cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, okay, chronic bronchitis, okay, Asthma, bronchiectasis, okay. emphysema, and pneumonia. Okay, so it should be what? One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, that's six uh, disorders, and that should be about three people a group with a class of 18, right? Can we just keep the groups that we already have for PMP? I don't know what groups you have. You <laughs> certainly can <laughs> if you already have groups. Okay, okay. Sure, I, I don't really care how you do it. That's uh, If you already have group, three yeah. people groups. Well, yeah. Yeah. There's two groups of four, and then the rest is groups of five. However you guys want to do it. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I, it However, you guys, I don't. I would not like to see groups of two or something like that. I'd like to have it you know, at least three people working together. Yeah. What I'm not looking for something really long, ten minutes at the most. So short presentation. That way, when you guys present, we can spend the first hour presenting, and then the second hour will be a review for your final exam, because this will be the week before finals. 
So I'm only looking for about a 10 minute presentation, okay? And I'm not looking for a complete pathophysiological rundown of the disorder. What I'm looking for is I'm looking to see that you guys know the major medications, the major medications that we're, what we often use to treat these disorders, um, the doses, frequency, and then monitor. You know, how do we monitor? What kinds of side effects are associated? What should we expect a patient to do? So really quick, um, and again, uh, a lot of these disorders, you may use the same medications. And that's okay if you, if you um, if a group ahead of you talks about the same medications that you talk about, that's all right. That's fine. Because there are a lot of disorders that use the same medications. Uh, but these are the major disorders that uh, I want you guys to make that connection with, medications. And some of these medications, like cystic fibrosis and pneumonia, you may have special medications that you'll use that are very specific. I would like you to just say a little bit about those as well. Okay, any questions about the, the, the presentations? Okay. If you Now, the sources that you do use, I'd at least like you to have the, that reference available. So if I ask you a question, well, why, uh, why are you saying this medication stabilizes mast cells? Uh, where did you find that out? Oh, it says it here in this page. As long as you guys know where you got your source from, that's fine. I'm not looking for a full APA format paper. I know you guys are doing plenty of those this semester. Uh, any other qu any questions on that? Okay. Yes. Um, where are we listing the uh, topics at? Listing. Which topic we? Pick? Your group. Yes. We'll pick one person to send me an email on Blackboard, and that one person will say, "Hey, this is group um, with this person, this person, this person." Okay, so it doesn't have to be like in a discussion. Or no, 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 no. Just, okay. just send me an email and say, "Hey, we're group one or whatever," and we, you know, uh, it's. Uh, uh, I have three, you know, these three people, A, B, and C, and we're doing chronic bronchitis. Should we post that so everybody sees it? Can more, you want each group to do a different topic, yes. right? Yeah. So then we So you guys will have to kind of talk among, we'll among yourselves. We'll have to put it on the, yeah. on mail, on the mail part. So you guys, yeah, just have to talk among yourselves real quick and, and do it. Uh, so if you could get that out in the next week or two, uh, then you have basically the rest of the semester to work on it. But Again, keep it simple. It's it's it, it should be pretty easy to do. Okay, guys. Any other questions? All right. Good luck for next week.